questions. Everybody seems to have a question that they need answered in life. Hi, my name is Eric. In this next seminar, Dr. Hoven takes a large variety of questions that he's been asked on a regular basis and combines them and gives his best explanation for what's happening. He covers a variety of topics such as the Red Sea Crossing, primitive man, what about radiocarbon dating? Hey, are there really contradictions in the Bible? Find out for yourself in this seminar entitled, Questions and Answers. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Kent Hovind. I taught high school science for 15 years and this is going to be seminar part 7, uh, question answer time. If you've gotten this far, hopefully you've seen the first six because we will be covering new information. I taught science 15 years and I cover information on the subject of creation, evolution and dinosaurs. I take the position that the Bible is literally true, scientifically accurate in all details and the evolution theory being taught in our schools is the dumbest and most dangerous religion in the history of planet Earth. We're going to be covering a wide variety of questions that I get during my Q&A time. Everywhere I go, I try to ask, you know, teach for an hour or so and then have question and answer time. And I've heard most of the questions that come up in the last 17 years that I've been doing this. We'll be covering a wide range of things like uh, how do we see stars billions of light years away? Have there any fresh dinosaur bones been found not even fossilized yet? Uh, why are there so few human bones found? Uh, what about the Bible codes? Why do you use the King James Version? Are there contradictions in the Bible? What about other religions? Could they be right? Is, what about global warming? Where do the races come from? A whole bunch of stuff we're going to be covering as quickly as we can. There is much more information about all of these topics on our college class. We taught college classes, CSE 101, the 100 series, 101, 2, 3, and 4. You can take those and where we have time to go into a lot more detail. And then the 200 series is even more depth than that, okay? So you can catch, if you don't get enough information, or if I don't answer one of your questions, you can call into our daily radio program. Every day, 4.30 to 6, currently, we may change the time someday, but currently, 4.30 to 6, Central Time, uh, Monday through Friday, when I'm not traveling, I'm live on the internet, drdino.com or truthradio.com, and you can do, uh, take our college classes and ask questions there. We cover just a whole lot more material. All of the slides that I use in my seminar, and it's close to 7,000 now, are available to download off my website, drdino.com, or you can just order the DVDs or CDs of all of the slides. And a lot of slides, you'll see they've got a little asterisk next to near the end. That indicates there's something in the notes section of the slide. And there's a lot of things I have to skip just for sake of time, but hopefully we can answer some questions for you here. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, I applied mine heart to know and search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things. I think it's wise for Christians especially to do that. Try to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason. And I think we could be more effective soul winners and more effective for God's kingdom if we knew more and could give an answer. That's the goal of all this of seminars that we produce is to equip people that can give an answer to know the truth. 1 Peter chapter 3 says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you the reason of the hope that's in you. And we hope that this training you'll get here will give you the answers you need. 1 Timothy 2 says, study to show yourself approved unto God. We should study and learn, not just so we can give an answer to others, but so God is pleased with us. That's the goal of study. God, are you happy? One of the questions I often get as I speak at universities is, hey, Hoven, are you the only one that believes in creation? Don't all scientists believe in evolution? <laughs> Absolutely not. I don't know how that question even comes up. Not all scientists do not believe in evolution, number one. Okay, Thousands and thousands and thousands of them are creation scientists. For instance, uh, Dr. Russell Humphreys uh, worked for years at the Sandia National Laboratories. There's a good article about him on the Answers in Genesis website. They've got a whole list of 180 some or 200 uh, scientists today who are young earth Bible-believing six-day creationists. Dr. Uh, Humphreys said, um, using a simple statistical approach, I would conservatively estimate that in the United States alone there are around 10,000 practicing professional scientists who openly believe in six-day recent creation. So first, it's not true that all scientists believe in evolution. Secondly, even if they did, that's not how you establish truth. It doesn't matter what the majority believe. The majority has, has a long history of being wrong, okay? They used to teach, you know, all the planets go around the earth. The majority was wrong, okay? Though, believe it or not, there still are some scientists who are geocentrists, who teach the earth is in the center. 
and everything goes around the earth. And there's, I've got the books in the library. You can read those if you want to take that. Uh, I've looked at the sub subject. I just I can't buy it yet. I think they're wrong. I think the sun is in the center. There are the time when they used to teach that big rocks fall faster than little rocks. That was taught for 2,000 years, and it's wrong. So the majority can be wrong. They used to teach the doctrine of humors. You know, if you're sick, you have bad blood. Take out your blood and you get better. That's how George Washington died. They were wrong. And in that case, they were dead wrong. Okay? Uh, in John chapter 7, Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the Scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David, out of the house town of Bethlehem? Notice what happened here in John chapter 7. The people were arguing about... It was Jesus really the Christ? And some of them said, wait, 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 Christ doesn't come out of Galilee, and Jesus came from Galilee. The problem is they had a misconception. They thought Jesus came from Galilee. Where was Jesus actually born? Bethlehem. So they had the whole wrong problem. They're arguing about the wrong subject. So in John 3, 43, it says, So there was a division among the people because of him, and some of them would have taken him. They would have tried to kill the messenger. Because they had a wrong impression, they're going after this. We've got to shut this guy up. This Jesus is out there preaching, and we've got to shut him up. They got the wrong impression to start with, and that's what happens. People get the wrong idea. They think creationists like me are doing damage to education system. No, we're, we're the right people. We're trying to fix the problem, okay? We're trying to resolve it. Verse 45 says, Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto him, Why have ye not brought him? Now, this is classic. Notice, the chief priests sent their hoodlums to go get Jesus. Jesus answered their questions. They came back and said, Wow, never man spake like this man. And then the Pharisees said, Well, you should have asked him this. I get this every time, including three days ago in uh, Michigan at the university up there. There's always some professor that says, you know, they, they advertise that Hovind's coming to the university to speak, Northern Uni Michigan University. Or the week before, it was in Wisconsin, at uh, uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A hundred professors in Milwaukee refused to debate me. Eighty professors at Northern Michigan University refused to debate me. I've had close to 4,000 now professors that have refused to debate on the subject. And they don't even come when I speak. They send their students and say, here, ask him this, ask him this, ask him this. The student comes back and says, teacher, he answered all my questions. And then the teacher says, you idiot, you should have asked him this and this and this. Well, teacher, you coward, why didn't you come, okay? <laughs> why didn't you ask the question? And professors do the same thing, just like the Pharisees did. The professors send their students to try to trap the creationists. They won't come themselves, okay? And then when they, that doesn't work, they try to use the law to silence them. Let's just pass a law that says you can't teach creation. Or if anybody does try to teach creation, we're going to get them fired, send them out of here. Then verse 47, Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Hovind translation, Are you stupid? Has this guy deceived you? Then they, this is the classic one they always use. Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? Translation. None of the other scientists believe this creation stuff. Therefore, evolution must be true. Now think about that logic. The majority believes this, therefore it's true. I mean, that's silly. First place, it's not true the majority believe it. Secondly, that's not how you tell. And then they said, but this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Hovind translation. We have knowledge, you don't. We have a degree, you don't. We don't approve of your degree. It's from a non-accredited Christian school. Therefore, we're smart, you're dumb. That's a common tactic used by the professors today. And the, the 99 professors I've debated, it happens all the time. And in one of the guys, Nicodemus very wisely said, Doth our law judge any man before it hear him? Nicodemus at least had the common sense to say, Hey, before we judge this guy Jesus and say he's wrong, he's stupid, etc., let's listen to what he's saying. And I would encourage college students and professors and anybody, listen to the creation side. Just listen. Really honestly listen and hear it, and then make your decision. When I spoke in Soviet Union uh, a couple years ago, I was at a university over there in, uh, I don't know, Pavel, if you remember what city I was in. It's in Ukraine, your home state. But uh, one of the cities had a university. They shut down the university and sent 30 professors to have me speak for two hours because on creation. I was a big celebrity, you know, Dr. Hoven from all the way from Florida, you know. The further I travel, the more famous I am, you know. When I'm right here in town, it's not famous at all. But I was, they shut down the university and 30 professors came. After about an hour of speaking on creation, one of the professors was crying. And I asked the translator, uh, this girl named Olga, I said, what's he crying about? And she said, he's never heard the creation story. He didn't know there was one. And I think there's a lot of people in America, a lot of students that I see in America, have never really honestly heard the creation story. So... If somebody says, everybody else believes in evolution, therefore you should too, number one, that's not a good argument, and it's not true, okay? 
and listen to the creation site. Understand it. Because when I get done talking, a lot of times, like in the airplane, I sat by somebody who believed in evolution just last week. I said, well, let me just explain the creation site. It took three minutes, explained the creation view very simply. And they said, wow, that makes a lot of sense. Well, yeah, just listen, okay, to what they, what they got to say. Okay. They started with the false assumption that Jesus was from Galilee. He wasn't, okay. He was actually born in Bethlehem. Some of the Pharisees had not believed him, so therefore that's proof that he's not right. You get the same thing today. Some scientists don't believe in creation, therefore creation is not true. That is absolutely stupid logic, okay? And has, they'll say, has he published in science journals? As if, well, you don't see creation articles in National Geographic, therefore that proves it's not right. Well, you didn't see many capitalist articles in communist journals 10 years ago either, by the way, you know. <laughs> it doesn't prove anything's right or wrong. The majority can be wrong. The majority followed Aaron into rebellion. The majority voted not to go into the Promised Land in Numbers chapter 32. The majority followed false gods many times in the Old Testament. The majority of the leaders hated Jesus. The majority of the world hates Christians. The majority voted in Bill Clinton twice, for heaven's sake. I mean, the majority can be wrong, all right? can be dead wrong. But it's not true that all scientists believe in creation. There's a book here by Robert Gentry. Uh, Robert Gentry is a good friend of mine from uh, uh, Tennessee. He is a very famous scientist who did work on the disposal of radioactive waste, nuclear waste. What do you do with this waste product? He would do research on the uh, granites around the world. He discovered that as you look at granites under a microscope, you find they got little tiny halos in them, po radio polonium halos. We'll get into more of that later. But as soon as they found out that his research was proving evolution is not true, because he really proves the earth was never a hot molten mass. He never mentioned creation, never mentioned God, just purely scientific research. They published him in all the major journals until somebody said, wow, guys, Gentry's work is proving the Big Bang Theory wrong. They got, took away his funding and shut him off like a spigot. They persecuted somebody just because his work was not supporting the sacred cow, i.e. evolution. Uh, Roger DeHart is, uh, was a science teacher at Burlington Edson High School near Seattle. He was told, he, they brought him into the office and said, you cannot tell your students about errors in the textbooks. All he was doing was bringing in current science journals. Here's a textbook that says the baby has gill slits, like we covered on video four. DeHart would bring in a science journal, says, guys, I'm sorry, it says on the, in the textbook on page you know, 220 that the baby has gills. That's not true. Here's a current science journal. See, here's the evidence. He never mentioned God, never mentioned the Bible, never mentioned creation. He just said this textbook's not accurate, and they told him he couldn't do that. You can't inform your students that the book is out of date? <laughs> That's the kind of persecution Christians get. When they, or anybody gets when they try to go against this evolution theory. Evolution is a carefully protected state religion. Just like communism was a carefully protected state religion when you grew up over there. You don't dare question it. Okay? Kevin Haley was a biology teacher in Oregon. He lost his job simply because he exposed errors in the textbooks. He told them, hey, this book's not right. There's a mistake here. They said, you're fired. Can't teach if you say there's errors in our books. Baylor University in Waco, Texas fired William Dembski in April 2000, simply because he told his students there might be an intelligent designer. He said, oh, you're not allowed to say that, so they fired him. This is Baylor, it used to be a Christian college, okay? Forrest Mims was a science writer for years. He wrote for many major journals, uh, National Geographic, Science Digest, American Journal of Physics. He wrote for all kinds of articles for magazines. But then when he applied for a job at uh, Scientific American, he was denied. They said, you can't work here because you are a creationist. Even though what he was writing on has nothing whatsoever to do with the subject of creation or evolution, they said, we don't want you on our staff because it would look bad if we hired a creationist. That's the type of persecution you get. Rod Levesque was told, he, he told his students, I kind of doubt this Darwin theory is true. So they took him away from teaching biology and gave him another job. They said, you don't, we don't want you teaching biology because you might make our students doubt Darwin's theory. That's how it's protected. It's a religion. There's a teacher in Indiana, Dan Clark, his principal called him in, Ed Eller, or the superintendent, and said he could not introduce creation to his class. Now there's no law against teaching creation at all. There are no court cases that says you can't teach creation. It, they just said you can't be mandatory. But teachers always have the right to teach creation. But here's the problem. The law says you can teach it. The court says you can teach it. But your boss now says you can't. So he quit his job finally over that. He stood firm and said, look, I'm not I'm not going to bow to this one. He quit his job. Dean Kenyon wrote the book, A Pandas and People. He was a science teacher at San Francisco State University. He wrote this book and says, it, it's, a, it's a biology textbook, basically, a science textbook. 
that says, hey, you know, there must have been some kind of designer. This is so complicated, this is amazing. There must have been a designer. It doesn't try to get him saved or converted to be a Baptist or a Buddhist or a Catholic. It just says, look, there must be a designer. He was a tenured biology professor, San Francisco State University. He had written all kinds of books about evolution when he believed in it. Then he got converted and said, you know, I really doubt that theory is true. It's just, it doesn't work. And so they fired him. But he was tenured, so he sued them and got his job back, and they put him in as a lab assistant washing test tubes, stuff that, you know, the students do. He had to sue him again to get his real job back. Just because he said, I think there might be a creator to this universe. That's the type of persecution you get. When I spoke in Lubbock, Texas uh, several years ago, <clears throat> they had a professor there named Dr. Dini, D-I-N-I, who teaches biology. He told, he told his students, if you don't believe in evolution, don't come ask me for a recommendation to go off to medical school, because I won't give you one. He said, it's all on, it was on his website for years. He said, if you don't believe in evolution, you'll never get a recommendation from me. Well, when I went to speak there in Lubbock, Texas, the students offered Dr. Denny $1,000 if he would debate me for two hours, and he refused. Thousand bucks for two hours. That's pretty good money, Leah. How'd you like to make $1,000 for two hours? I mean, that, he said, no, he won't do it. The persecution that happens against Christians and against creationists in the secular school system is, is mind-boggling. What are they afraid of? So I say, well, it's not true that all scientists believe in creation, but many scientists that do believe in creation are afraid to say anything because they know the kind of persecution you're going to get. How many teachers were there in Ukraine that did not believe in communism but didn't dare say anything about it? You know, anybody, even, if you don't even smile right at Stalin, he'd kill you. You know, you'd end up in the gulag someplace. That's the kind of thing that's happened in America, believe it or not. If a person doesn't support the evolution theory vocally and actively, they'll be banished to academic Siberia. They lose their grant money. They will lose their uh, job. You know, it's sad. And Patrick Henry College was told back in November of uh, 2002, I believe, that they, they weren't going to get accreditation because they didn't teach enough evolution in their college. There's an article in Agape Press here. A university professor said she was asked to resign for introducing elite students to flaws in Darwinian thought at the Mississippi University of, for Women. I spoke just north of there a few weeks after this happened. I talked to some of the people involved. This lady was told she had to resign her job because she was her, her teaching might make students doubt Darwinism. What are they going to school for? In education or indoctrination? <laughs> yeah, you're going to get an education, I thought. And it used to be that way, but it's just not anymore. It's pretty sad. And this lady said that this professor that wanted to fire her hadn't even heard her speech. But she was, you know, raising doubts about Darwinism. Um, all kinds of scientists down through history, I mean like thousands of them, all the branches of science were started by creationists. There's a list, there's a good list on Answers in Genesis. Just go to AnswersInGenesis.org website and type in scientists who believe creation. And it'll bring up all kinds of articles and you can read about all these scientists down through history who have been creationists, very famous scientists. I've often asked evolutionists, I say, guys, can you name me one advancement in modern science we've had because of the evolution theory? Is that why we have computers? Is that why we have, you know, telephones, radios? Is that why we went to the moon? What advancements can be named because of this evolution theory? They've never given an answer. There is nothing. The theory is useless. But all major science, all the whole branches of science in the last 400 years were started by creationists. Now, they weren't all young earth creationists like me, and they certainly weren't all independent, temperamental, fundamental, right-wing, radical Baptists like me. But they were, you know, creationists. Werner von, von Braun, the head of our space program, was a creationist. Uh, A.E. Wildersmith, William Ramsey, the Wright brothers, they studied birds. They said, we want to see how the designer, the creator, how God made the birds, and we'll learn how to make an airplane by studying airplanes. The guy who invented the MRI, Magnetic Resonance Imaging Machine, is a young earth creationist. There are creationists today. There are a couple good books we have in our library or for sale on our website. In Six Days is one and On the Seventh Day. This is uh, 50 scientists who believe in creation. Here's 40 more scientists who believe in creation. You can get these. these are, there are thousands of scientists who do believe in creation, do not believe in evolution. Karl Popper, a famous uh, uh, leading philosopher of science. He said, evolution is not a fact. Evolution doesn't even qualify as a theory or hypothesis. It's a metaphysical research program. It's not really testable science. Evolution is a religion. And they get so angry when I tell them that, which is probably why I tell them that, you know, every few minutes, because I enjoy pushing the right buttons, you know. 
Julian Huxley, his grandfather, uh, the Thomas Huxley, was the guy who really pushed Darwin when Darwin's book came out. Julian Huxley said, I suppose the reason we leapt at Origin of Species was the idea of God interfered with our sexual mores. We don't want God telling us what to do. That's why they've accepted evolution. Uh, Michael Ruse said, Evolution is promulgated, uh, promoted by its practitioners as more than a mere science. Evolution is promulgated as an ideology of secular religion, a full-fledged alternative to Christianity with meaning and morality. He said, I am an ardent evolutionist and an ex-Christian. But I must admit that in this one complaint, and Mr. Gish is one of many to make it, the literalists are right. Evolution is a religion. This was true of evolution in the beginning, and it's true of evolution still today. Evolution is a religion in every sense of the word. Evolution is a fairy tale for grown-ups. The theory has helped nothing in the progress of science. It's useless. So it's not true. They all believe it. Nearly all branches of science were started by creationists. Evolution theories added nothing to science. When students or professors fear expressing their real honest thoughts, they're not getting educated, they're getting indoctrinated. Students get flunked for not supporting the evolution theory. Every week when I go out and speak, somebody will come to me and say, when I was in biology class, I wrote a paper and they, the teacher gave me an F because it didn't support evolution or because I dared to go against the evolution theory. I get calls like that. Uh, Diane, you take some of the calls and transfer them over to me. Students saying, hey, what, what do I do? My teacher gave me an F because I didn't, my, teach, my paper went against evolution. It's sad. I mean, it's discrimination. All the advancements in modern technology have nothing to do with evolution. Evolution is a hindrance to science, not, uh, not a help at all. Okay, next question. What about separation of church and state? Well, there's no such phrase in the Constitution. You can get the entire Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence for one dollar. This little book, Citizen's Rule Book, excellent book. Everybody ought to read this one. It's got a great story in here about the jurors. It's amazing the power that jurors have. One juror can decide he doesn't like the law. And if a person's, if they pass a law in your city that says, you know, you can't spit on the sidewalk, and somebody spits on the sidewalk, and they videotape him. They got the whole thing. It's, he, de he broke the law. I mean, it's, they take him to court. It's proven. He broke the law. But you as a juror say, I don't like that law. I don't think it's fair to say you can't spit on the sidewalk. The judge is going to threaten all the jurors and say, now you have to rule according to the law. You've got to listen to my instruction. You don't have to listen to anything that judge says. He's, he's, he's blowing smoke, okay? Smile, nod your head. When you get in that jury room, you vote not guilty. And the rest of the jurors are going to think you're nuts. What do you mean not guilty? You saw the tape. You saw it. Yes, I know. But the law is no good. Jury nullification. Powerful, powerful story here. Anyway, the, the Constitution does not mention separation of church and state. You should get the Federalist Papers. Uh, those are all the papers that the Founding Fathers wrote as they were developing this Constitution. And you can see their thinking process. The, day, the same day they voted for the First Amendment, you know, which people often say separation of church and state, which is not what it says, it says the state shall have, the government shall not make a religion or prohibit the free exercise thereof. But that same day, Congress voted to send $25,000 to help a Catholic missionary start a mission to help the Indians in St. Louis. They were not trying to separate church from state. They wanted to keep the state out of the church, but not keep the church out of the government. No phrase in the Constitution about separation of church and state. And it's perfectly fine for Christian teachers to do all kinds of Christian things in their school. My brother taught 34 years, public school, had a picture of Jesus right by his desk all 34 years. Many teachers keep a Bible right on their desk. Now, if they give you a hard time, the principal might say you can't do that. I'm not saying you won't get persecution. But as far as legally, you can. There's uh, lc.org, libertycouncil.org, Matt Staver's organization. He handles cases like that. Uh, David Gibbs, uh, they do stuff like that. David Gibbs, it's uh, his organization in Orlando, Florida. So yes, if you have trouble, you know, see one of those folks. But what happened? Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter to some Baptist pastors, and he's the one that mentioned the phrase in the letter, separation of church and state. And now the atheists are using that to say, oh, you can't have Christian things in government. <laughs> what a dumb idea. Our f country was founded to be a Christian country. They all said that. Go to uh, wallbuilders.com, David Barton's great website. He's got lots of stuff on. There's no such thing as separation of church and state. So don't fall for that. And we can cover more on that in our college class. Here's what's happened, though. The Constitution of the United States, Article 1, Section 10, says, you have the right to make a contract. Let's suppose Adam says, Brother Hovind, I'll, I'm going to pay you $10 an hour the rest of my life. Okay, and he signs a contract. And then he does not fulfill the contract. Well, then I can sue him. And he could say, I've got a constitutional right to keep my money. Yes, you do. But you also have a constitutional right to make a contract. And you made a contract. 
So the judge is just going to uphold contract law. Okay, a question that I very frequently get asked, I would say every single week I go speak, which is 52 weeks a year now for 16 years, every single week somebody will say, now Hoven, how do we see stars billions of light years away? You say the earth is only 6,000 years old, how do we see the stars? Yesterday on the radio program, on, on the website, Dr. Dino, some guy called in and said, now, Hoven, I did some studies and in a 6,000 year light year radius, we'd only have so many cubic miles and uh, all the stars wouldn't fit. I said, oh, wait, wait, wait. You're, you're, who said anything about a 6,000 mile radius? He said, well, you're the one that said the universe is only 6,000 years old. Yes, I did. But I did not say all the stars are within a 6,000 light year radius. <laughs> I've never said that. That would be ludicrous. But how do we see the stars billions of light years away if the universe is only 6,000 years old? And I believe the Bible clearly teaches it's only 6,000 years old and God made everything. Actually, He made the earth first in Genesis 1 and then verse 14, He made the stars also. Evolution says he made the stars evolve first and then the earth. Well, there's certainly a lot of stars out there. Nehemiah chapter 9 says, Thou, even thou art Lord alone. Thou hast made the heaven, the heaven of heavens. God is claiming that he made them. So, either he did or he didn't. But what about the stars? How do they fit in? Astronomers can see a star blow up about every 30 years. It's not, every, no, it's not like it's on a timetable. It might be every five years, might be every 50 years, but on an average, every 30 years, a star explodes. And they're looking out there with their telescope and say, oh, wow, there's a new one. A star exploded. It's called a nova. Or if it's a big one, they call it a supernova. Um, <clears throat> nova in Spanish means no go. By the way, the Chevy Nova did not sell very well in Mexico for that reason. Hey, do you want to buy a nova? No. Why would I do that? <laughs> it won't go. But <clears throat> stars blow up every 30 years. Well, they've searched the heavens with these telescopes looking for how many supernova rings are there. They call it a dead star. Or they can find less than 300. Now, wait a minute. If there are less than 300 supernova rings, and one happens every 30 years, you can do the math. I mean, that's about 9,000 years. If the universe is billions of years old, there ought to be a whole lot more supernova rings out there. Why are there less than 300 supernova rings? Uh, because it's less than 10,000 years old? Boy, they don't like that answer at all. But that's the logical conclusion. Anyway, if stars are blowing up every 30 years, we would have to have at least one star born every 30 years just to keep the balance. I mean, countries that have a population problem because they're getting less births and deaths, you know, like Germany, more people are dying than being born. Oh, well, eventually that's going to create a problem, okay? Uh, stars should have to be born. Nobody's ever seen one star form. Not one. We see them blow up all the time. They've never seen a star form, and I'll cover that in a second. Its last estimate by Hubble Telescope was that there are 70 sextillion stars. 70 sextillion. They say the universe is 20 billion years old. Well, you can do the math. That means six and a half million stars would have to form every minute. We'd have to have six and a half million stars forming every minute for 20 billion years to make the stars that we know about. It doesn't count the ones we don't know about because we can't see them yet. Who knows how many stars are out there? Sometimes the textbooks will say, well, there are new stars being constantly born in clouds of gas and dust. This is so stupid. How a physics textbook can teach this, I don't know. Anybody that knows freshman physics knows when you try to squeeze gases together, it pressure builds up, temperature builds up, and it drives them back apart. It's called Boyle's Gas Law. Nobody has ever seen dust collapsing into a solid. It would take such incredible pressure to do that. I, I was in a debate one time and this professor, I asked him, I said, how can you get dust to collapse into a, into a solid? Explain that to me. He said, well, we calculated that if 20 stars explode near each other, it'll produce enough pressure to make a brand new star. I said, now that's brilliant. You got to lose 20 to gain one. Hmm? I said, you ought to run for Congress. You could help those guys borrow their way out of debt, you know. <laughs> it's not going to get a universe full of stars if you've got to lose 20 to gain one. And even that is only theoretical. It's never been observed, okay. I was in Alamogordo, New Mexico, and they've got a science center down there, and they showed these pictures of star babies. They said, oh, this is a new star forming. No, sir, it's a bright spot, okay. One guy in Science Magazine admitted, the silent embarrassment of modern astrophysics is we do not know how even a single one of these stars managed to form. Nobody knows how stars can form from dust clouds. No one has unambiguously observed material falling into an embryonic star. 
which should be happening if the star is truly still forming. And no one has caught a molecular cloud in the act of collapsing. Precisely how a section of interstellar cloud collapses gravitationally into a star, a double or multiple star, or a solar system is still a challenging theoretical problem. Astronomers have yet to find an interstellar cloud in the actual process of collapse. The origin of stars represents one of the most fundamental unsolved problems of contemporary physics. This guy said, no one really understands how star formation proceeds. It's really remarkable. Nobody knows how this happens. So if they tell you new stars are forming, you tell them Kent Hovind said they're confused or they're lying. Because nobody knows how it happens. There's not even a good theory how you could squeeze dust into a star. Not e and there's certainly no evidence. But here's what happened. They see bright spots appear in the clouds. Or not in the clouds, in the star, uh, dust clouds in space. They look at this crab nebula or eagle nebula and they're staring at it and all of a sudden one day a spot gets a little brighter. And, oh wow, a star is being born. That's immediately their conclusion that a star is being born. I said, wait, wait, wait. Maybe the dust in front of it is clearing and the star was already there. Hmm? Maybe it's a star blowing up. Maybe it's another supernova. Because that's what happens when stars supernova, they get really bright. They don't know that a star is forming. So don't let them tell you that we've seen stars form. Nobody has seen such a thing. All we do is we see them blow up, which is the opposite of what evolutionists need. Now, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years, and He made the stars also. Here God is claiming He made the stars, and it says in Psalm, He counts the number of the stars. Not only how many there are total, but each one has its own number. So God will say, oh, this is star number 42 trillion, you know, 718 billion. He, he, he knows the number of each one. And it says, praise Him, ye waters that be above the heavens, in Psalm 148. This is the only verse that says anything like this. Waters that be above the heavens. Now in Genesis uh, 1, it talks about verse 6 and 7, water that be above the heavens. I believe when God first made the world, it was very, very different than what we see. Mostly land, instead of the huge oceans that we now have. Most of that water was in the crust of the earth. We covered that in video 2. But there was earth and there was heaven, singular. King James is the only Bible I'm aware of that gets it right in Genesis 1.1, where it says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. All the rest of them say heavens. Okay, that's a mistake. There was heaven, which means expanded place. There was earth, and then from here, on out. Then he divides it up into three slices. First heaven, second heaven, third heaven. The first heaven is where the birds fly. Genesis 1 uh, talks about that, verse 20 and 21. Then there was water above the firmament. Now, some creationists do not believe in the canopy theory. I understand. I've read their stuff. I think they're wrong. I, th I still believe, even if, and some accuse me, well, you know, you don't agree with us, therefore, you know, you're not a good creation scientist. You know, to keep up on your research. I keep very much up on the research, and I disagree. It's not that I haven't read it. It's that I have read it and disagree. <laughs> okay? But I believe there was a layer of air for Adam to breathe, a layer of water above to protect him, and then a layer of stars, and then more water. The only verse I have to back it up is right here, Psalm 148. Praise Him, ye waters that be above the heavens. That's present tense. Is there still water above the heavens? Psalm 104 says, he layeth, Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. Could it be that there is another layer of water beyond all of outer space? Maybe everything that we see as this universe, which looks like huge, maybe everything we see is inside water, a crystal, and God is outside of that, the third heaven, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Could there be a third layer where God lives? Of course, God doesn't need a place to live. He, he just is, you know. Psalm 20, 29 says, The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The Lord is upon many waters. Maybe everything that we see when we step out at night and say, Wow, look at all these stars. Maybe the whole thing is a little snow globe on God's dresser. You know, that He picks up and shakes once in a while. Hmm, how you doing in there? You know? <laughs> I don't know. I like to think that way. But the Psalm 148, the waters that be above the heavens, you know, people have often asked, Hey, where does, where's the last star? And once we find it, what's on the other side? I don't know the answers to those, but just a possibility is that there, according to the Bible, may still be water above the heavens. But there's a lot of stars out there. Hubble estimate was 11 trillion stars per person. That is 76 trillion divided by 6 billion people. Every one of you gets 70, gets 11 trillion stars. What happened? They told the Hubble telescope to focus in on a dot. <clears throat> they found a dot above the Big Dipper, 
you can see the picture of it there, it is about the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. And it was black. They said, we don't think there's any stars there. Let's focus in on that spot and see what we can find. They took pictures for 10 days straight, focusing in on that dot. After 10 days, they, there were more stars in that dot than they could count. These were brand new stars, never been seen before. Called it Deep Field, uh, uh, Hubble Deep Field. Looking up there saying, man, that's stuff we didn't know about. Assumption would be that it's that way all through space. Truly, the stars cannot be numbered, which is what the Bible says, they cannot be numbered. But how do you tell the distance to the stars and how can the earth be 6,000 years old and the stars be so far away? Fair question. Uh, Stephen Hawking said, stars are so far away, they appear to be just pinpoints of light. We cannot see their size or shape. How do we tell different types of stars apart? For the vast majority, there's only one thing we can see, and that is the color of their light. If you get the biggest telescope on Earth, this is not it, by the way, <coughs> spotting scope, but if you get the largest telescope on Earth and look at the closest star, which is Alpha Centauri, four and a half light years away, all you're going to see is a dot. If I focus this in on the sun, it'll start to get you know, bigger and bigger, and you can actually flames, see flames leaping off and see the spicules, and you can see color changes, and you can actually see features of the sun. When you look at a star, you never get to see that. Nobody has ever seen a star as far as any of the features of it. You get the biggest telescope on Earth, it's going to be nothing but a dot in your scope. All you can tell is, I said, that's a red one, that's a yellow one, that's a blue one. That's all you can see. So anything we do, we have to make, do based on assumptions just from the color. But how do you tell the distance to the star? Well. I taught high school trig for years, and if you guys had trig, you know how it works. Uh, if you have two observation points, you can calculate the third distance. You have to know it. It's a solving a triangle. Trigonometry deals with triangles, so you sine, cosine, tangent. If you know two, one distance and two angles, or two, two distances and one angle, you can calculate the rest of the triangle using sine, cosine, tangent. Here's the problem. Earth is only 8,000 miles in diameter, which compared to star distance is, is zero, it's nothing. So if I'm looking at a star and somebody over in China is looking at a star, we are 8,000 miles away from each other, straight line through the earth. That would be nothing. What they've done to enlarge the distance to look at a star, instead of just being opposite sides of the earth, the earth is also going around the sun in this great big huge circle. We're going 66,000 miles an hour and it takes us a year to go around. It's a great big racetrack. Well, the distance from the Earth to the Sun is about 93 million miles, average, and that's, that's a lot, but at the speed of light, it's not much. At the speed of light, it's eight minutes away. It takes the sunlight eight minutes to get to the Earth. So if we're eight, mi eight light minutes from the Sun, the diameter of our orbit going around is 16 light minutes. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a star in January, and then we're going to look at the star in June, and we have now gone halfway around this monster circle. And we're going to get two observation points to try to enlarge the base of our triangle. And it sounds huge. Man, that's 186 million miles. Well, it's still not much. A year has 525,000 minutes in a year. If this picture here showing the little yellow dot was the scale, if that yellow dot represented Earth's orbit, not the Earth's diameter, the orbit of the Earth. It's way too big for the picture. What we're going to do is try to get to show you the math involved here. If I had two surveyors setting up with their transits or telescopes, and they are 16 inches away from each other, and they're both looking at a dot 525,000 inches away, which is eight and a third miles, would you agree that would make a rather skinny triangle? Let's go out in the parking lot and draw a triangle with you know, point A and point B 16 inches apart and point C eight and a third miles away. It's going to make a real skinny triangle. That is exactly the triangle you get when two people on opposite sides of Earth's orbit try to measure one light year. One. Now, and I'm not sure exact, you can tell exactly where you were six months ago. I think that would be a little stretch of the imagination to say, oh yeah, six months ago in January we were, where were we? Over? <laughs> I'll give them that. I won't even argue that. I just would bring that up you know, for appeal, Your Honor, in case we need to. Uh, you can't know exactly where you were six months ago. 
but the angle you get with that is 0 0.017 degrees. Now let's imagine this. I want you to get two guys to set up their surveying transits. They're 16 inches apart, and I'm going to go put a dot eight and a third miles away, but they don't know how far away it is. They're both focusing in on the dot, and they see this dot out there. Here's the only information they have. The measurement between themselves, 16 inches, and the angle out of parallel. I say, guys, I want you to calculate how far away that dot is based on that little angle change you get. I think that would be difficult to measure one light year. You'd certainly be, there'd be some guesswork involved, okay? Now, if you want to measure 100 light years, you've got a much worse problem. Now you've got to move your dot 830 miles away. If we had two guys on the roof of this building here in Pensacola, Florida, 16 inches apart, and they're both focusing on a dot in Chicago, which is 830 miles away, but they don't know how far away it is, they're going to tell me how far away it is based only on their angle of their telescope out of parallel. I would say that's impossible. Impossible. To measure 15 billion, no question that's impossible. I don't think you can measure 100 light years, not with real numbers, not with real measurements, but this textbook says they can measure, parallax trigonometry can measure up to 100 light years. Okay, I doubt it, but I'll give them 100. I'll give them 1,000 if they quit crying, okay? The fact is you can't measure a billion. Simple fact. So here's some things to consider about starlight. They said in, in 2004 that the new SIM technology, Space Interferometry Mission, they hope to get where they can improve the distance of measuring star to stars. And they say this accuracy will enable SIM to determine stellar distances to 10% accuracy out to a distance of 482,000 million million miles. That's 82,000 light years. And then it says, this is an improvement of several hundred times over what is possible today. Well, now, wait a minute. If they're going to improve it several hundred times, and it ends up being 82,000, what's 82,000 divided by several hundred comes out to be several hundred. Apparently, they're admitting they can only measure several hundred light years, which I would agree. I mean, I would say that's even a stretch, but I'll give them several hundred. They can't measure billions, is the point. So when you students in school get taught, oh, that, that star is, you know, 14.629 you know, billion light years away, say, I don't believe you. I don't believe you at all. It might be, but you can't prove that. They're making up a story. With SIM technology, they hope to finally be able to get out to where they can measure most of the way across our galaxy, and we're in it. We can't even measure across our own galaxy, let alone these distances to other galaxies. So, I think we should look at the stars and say, wow, what a mighty God we serve. Instead of going out there and say, well, we know how far that way it is, we know it evolved. I mean, it's just that egotistical attitude some of these atheists get that makes you want to slap them in the face, like, man, why don't you serve God? Look what he made, you know? Here's the things to consider concerning starlight, then we'll take a break. Number one, we cannot measure these great distances. It just cannot be done. Number two, nobody knows what light is. Is it, they call it a wave or a photon or a particle. You know, we, we, we know what it does. We use it all the time. But actually, give me a jar of it and paint it red. Nobody knows the substance of it. What is light? And we sure don't know that it always travels the same speed all through time or space. The entire theory behind a black hole is that light can be attracted by gravity. Well, if light can be attracted by gravity, then you cannot say the speed of light is a constant. Okay? At Harvard University back in 99, they slowed light down to 38 miles an hour. The next year they slowed it down to one mile an hour, and the next year brought it to a dead stop. Light goes, you know, pretty quick, 186,000 miles a second. They slowed it down. It was done at Harvard, it was done at Smithsonian, it was done at Cambridge University, a repeatable, demonstrable experiment. Now that is science. If you do an experiment, get a result, somebody else follows your data, does the same experiment, gets the same result, that's science. They slowed light down. This article came out on Fox News Channel. They said, we've succeeded in holding a light pulse still. They brought the speed of light to zero, brought it to a dead stop. Meanwhile, back in 2000 at Princeton University, they speeded light up to 300 times the speed of light. So when somebody says that star is 10 billion light years away, which I doubt they can measure, therefore that we can prove the universe is 10 billion years old, they got several problems in their logic right away that they probably don't see, which is why we do these seminars, so we can help people understand. 
It's 300 times the speed of light. Uh, astronomer Barry Setterfield, uh, Australian government astronomer, said, during the last 300 years, 164 measurements of the speed of light have been published using 16 different measurement techniques. The speed of light has apparently decreased so rapidly, experimental error cannot explain it. This is a chart showing the decline in the speed of light from the published numbers in the last 150 years. You notice the decline in the chart. The speed of light is getting slower until about 1960. For the last 40 years, anybody that's measured the speed of light gets the same number, 186,282.4, I think, miles per second. Who cares? Well, <clears throat> it could be that it's, it leveled off in 1960 for two possible reasons, three possible reasons. Our way of measuring is getting better. Instruments are getting better. We're smarter. You know, everybody in the past was dumb. We're smart. We got it right. Could be. That's what they'll tell you. Second option, though, is we're at the tail end of a logarithmic curve, and you're much less likely to see any decline. As you get further out on the logarithmic curve, it pretty much levels out. But a third reason is 1956 is when they invented the atomic clock. And they started using that as their clock to measure the speed of light. Well, now, wait, wait, wait. The atomic clock is based on the wavelength of a cesium-133 atom. So the clock is based on the speed of light. Now, if you have a clock based on the speed of light and you're measuring the speed of light with it, if the speed of light changes, you're never going to catch it with that clock. It's like watching two twi twins grow next to each other. Well, neither one's growing. <laughs> well, duh. You got a rubber ruler problem here. Clear back in 87, they said the speed of light was 10 billion times faster at time zero. There must have been a faster speed of light. There have been articles from the 80s, 90s, 2000s saying, look, the speed of light is not a constant. They said, no physical law prevents anything from exceeding the speed of light. In two published experiments, the speed of light was apparently exceeded by as much as a factor of 100. The Big Bang Theory requires a much faster speed of light. Uh, Dr. Magluelchio, however you pronounce his name here, I got his book on the table. He says, a shocking possibility is the speed of light might change in time during the life of the universe. Could it be the speed of light was faster? Here's an article in... Uh, the newspaper said, speed of light may have changed over history, study says. Winnipeg Free Press, nothing's reliable, not even the speed of light. We have shown that a time-varying speed of light could provide a resolution to well-known cosmological puzzles. One of the mysteries of a decaying speed of light seems to be able to explain why opposite extremes of the cosmos that are too far apart to have been in contact with each other appear to obey the same rules of physics and even about the same temperatures. It would only be possible for light to cross from one side to the other if it traveled much faster than today, moments after the universe was created. Is the speed of light really a constant? There are articles here in Reuters News Service, the speed, light, speed of light may not be a constant. I have dozens of articles like this in the last 15 years, and this will be much more detail in our college class about the speed of light. So don't let somebody tell you the speed of light is a constant. We don't know that. Big article came out in Discover Magazine, says, was Einstein wrong about the speed of light back in 2000? He said, yeah, Einstein was wrong. The speed of light is not a constant. There's the book by the Italian scientist, I'm assuming he's Italian, it says, look, the speed of light is not a constant. And there have been many articles published about this. You can read them for yourself. I'll flash to them quickly here and you can get the details. So the third thing to consider, the creation was finished when God made it. Not only can we not measure those distances, not only is the speed of light not necessarily a constant, the creation was done. See, Jesus made wine out of grapes that never existed. He missed all that time. Instead of going from the water in the ground, through the plant, into the grape, squeeze it, make the wine, now drink it. No, Jesus turned the water straight to wine. What happened to all the intermediate steps? God can bypass all that. He doesn't need any of that. Okay? I ask people the question, how old was Adam on day six? Anybody know how old was Adam on day six? Zero. Did he look zero? No. He looked 52, 53 next month. But uh, he looked perfect top, you know, physical condition. God didn't make two babies and put them in the Garden of Eden and hand them a package of seeds and say, here, plant these quick. You're going to need supper. <laughs> it has to be a full-grown man, full-grown woman, full-grown garden. They got to have supper like tonight, you know. Better be something hanging on the tree ready to eat. Even if you plant a tree, you're going to take four or five years to get fruit off it. So the creation had to be mature. A fourth thing to consider about the speed of light question. A light year is a distance, it's not a time. It's a distance. 
And since the speed of light is not proven to be consistent, why would star distance have anything to do with the age of the universe? Now, I am not saying and have never said all of the stars are inside of a 6,000 mile radius of the Earth. That is not what I say. I don't know any creationist that teaches that. So when they say that, they're setting up a straw man, you know, knocking it down. They're, they're lying, basically. The stars probably are billions of light years away. They probably are. We just can't measure them, that's all. I like this article on the Discover. It said, how do scientists measure the age of stars? They said, well, we can find the absolute ages by comparing a star's color and brightness with those in stellar evolution models. What? We can tell how old it is by how old we think it is. That's exactly what they're saying right there. That's dumb, okay? Now, I think everybody's asking the totally wrong question. Everybody's saying, how did the light get from the star to the earth? They're asking the wrong question. Seventeen times in the Bible, it says God stretched out the heavens. Well, if He stretched out the heavens, they're asking the wrong question. It's not how did the light get from the star to here, but how did the star get from here to there? That's the question we need to be asking. The Bible says pretty clearly God made the earth first, and then He made the stars also. And He stretched, suppose He made the earth, and then He stretched out the stars from here. Adam would see the stars on day six, and day seven, and day eight. As the star is being stretched out into place, it's going to leave behind a trail of light. So the stars could be billions of light years away today, and still have been created in the six days, 6,000 years ago. Russell Humphreys has a book, which I read, and I, I just have to say, I didn't understand it, all of it. He's really, really smart, but uh, it's a good one on starlight and time if you want to get more on that. I don't know that I agree with his premise. I think he starts with the assumption the speed of light is a constant. Now, how do we explain that? And they get into this warped space and bent space stuff. I don't go, I think it's much simpler. The speed of light's not a constant, and God made things and stretched them out into place. So, if that stretching took place, maybe that explains why we have a red shift. And we'll cover the red shift question in just a minute after the break.